On this episode of the Lobby of Hobbies, Jazz jumps into the vast world that is collectible card games. But don't be scared off just yet, because if the talk of Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh are pushing you away, much of this is unexplored territory for Jazz as well. He gets together with his good friend, the CCG connoisseur, Nuon, to discuss if there is a CCG worth trying, even if it's just casually. They even discuss some possible alternatives, and if that doesn't interest you, they talk some board games as well. So get ready to enter, share, and discover. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Lobby of Hobbies podcast. I'm your host, Jazz. First and foremost, I want to thank you for entering the lobby. Today, we hope to share a little bit of the things that we do with you in hopes that you guys can not only share it with other people, but discover something that you've never done and that you've never even maybe thought about trying and maybe add that to your hobby repertoire. So on today's topic, we're going to be talking about CCGs. For those in the gaming world, many people know what CCGs are. They are collectible card games. So this is your Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic. Those are the big three, but we might talk about some stuff that you may not know is out there. Um, if I've turned you off from the topic CCGs, please stick around because we're going to b- talk maybe a little about the crossover from CCG into board games or maybe board games into CCGs. You never know. So again, stick around. We have a special guest with us today, my special friend um, who I actually got to meet and um, become friends with, I would say lifelong friends. That's how I, how close I consider this gentleman here. Um, he's my friend um, north of me up in New York City. It's my brother, uh, Nuon. Nuon, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jazz. Thanks for having me today. No, no, no. It's, it's awesome having you. Um, like I said, um, we have developed a friendship through CCGs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that friendship has stuck. It's not something that we just, hey, showed up at a store, um, you know, just competed against each other and was like, hey, how's it going? No, no. Our competitive nature with each other built a <laughs> friendship, which is pretty awesome. Yep. So, um, Nuan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'll, the floor is open. I give it to you. Just right. you have the free reign to tell us who you are, what about you, family life, all that good stuff. Okay. Yeah. I think it's probably also, uh, Interesting to point out that uh, one of the first times you and I actually hung out, we we drove all the way down to Ohio uh, to compete in one of these uh, collectible card games. And I, I just remember my wife thinking, like, who is this jazz guy? Is he going to kill my husband? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember you telling me, it's like, uh, yeah, I think she's kind of worried. She wants to make sure who you are. Uh, she, you might get a Facebook uh, friend request. I think we've known each other for, like, what three years now? Like three years now? It, it might even be four. I don't even it, remember. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. But uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Nuon, and um, I uh, I kind of live and breathe board games and card games. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot to know about me. I uh, I live in Staten Island, uh, New York City, uh, working remotely now with COVID, everything going on. Um, so is my wife. Uh, we've been married for year and a half now in quarantine uh is uh has its its ups and downs uh she's i'm like in meetings literally nonstop all day so maria uh it's best wife in the world by the way yeah uh but she uh is stuck in that bedroom uh just because like she can't like watch tv in the living room or anything like that uh because i just i'm constantly in front of clients and like she doesn't want to have to like put clothes on in order to be in front of me in a meeting or something. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I, uh, I started playing board games, maybe like 15, I think. Uh, Well, really CCGs. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh was my, uh, my first big, uh, entry into the the scene and my collection for card games and board games has uh, evolved, I think like exponentially since then. Um, and now we're talking about, like tens of thousands of cards underneath my bed right now 
if if not more. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. We've had that discussion. I was like, where do you stick all these card games at? You're like, yeah, they're under my bed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the safest place for them. So you have the the sword, another sword protecting the the cards right underneath the bed, and then. <laughs> stacks and stacks of board games we actually had to move up one of our dressers uh to make room for another like layer of cards that's how insane it's been wow yeah. so so card game so so pretty much that was your entry into the hobby was was ccgs or collectible card games yeah oh yeah absolutely okay yeah. so when when did you start making that transition starting like into board games so it's uh it's funny like i can remember like the moment it happened um but i was at a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament uh, at a, a local store in staten island fortunately it's closed down now but um i went in uh we played a bunch of our friends went it was great and uh the tournament ended pretty pretty early i think after a while your local scene starts fizzling down to like 15 people and then like a tournament can end up being like like three or four hours if you get it done quickly um so we went we still, it was still daylight. We wanted to do something else. So I started rummaging through their clearance bin uh, at the card game store and they just had a bunch of these board games. So we said, hey, what the hell, let's do it. Um, and I found I, I found this board game and it has like changed my life. It's, uh, I found uh, Yeto uh, and you, you of course know my kind of obsession with this game. Yes. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, we uh, we picked it up. Uh, I think the game was going for like sixty dollars, and I found it for like twenty five. And uh... which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. because I think even before the most recent deluxe printing, that game was still going for more than sixty bucks. I think yeah. in, some, in some spaces because it was out of print. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think I just I got lucky. I don't know how it happened. It was calling out to me. Um, I, uh, I I had the whole. Uh, like Japanese kind of themed art uh, liking based on my my Yu-Gi-Oh playing, but uh, we we picked it up. We learned how to play. It took a while because when when you're playing a game like that, uh, like a very heavy, uh, and you know, and you might not even consider it heavy, but for me it, it was at the time. But uh, when you play a heavy game like that and you're not used to playing any sort of like worker placement strategy games, it's it's a lot to pick up your first time around. Yeah, uh, but um. I loved it, and I still do. It's my favorite board game of all time. Yeah. And it, it, what's what's so crazy about that is that you pretty much went in, even coming from a CCG background, where you know me as I would always consider myself a CCG novice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the from the grand from the grand scheme of things, is that you went you went like head first, like like all the way in like it wasn't just like heads on into the deep section it wasn't even like you know let's just let's just tiptoe in or like just put my head in. you went into the deep section like i started with games like you know categories and things like that and pandemic mm -hmm. which is super on the light side compared to yeto mm -hmm. and it, it's not even that it's um like a really hard hard game um but it's there's complexity into it you right and it's you know that that strategy base behind it mm -hmm. um but let's get let's get back to the ccg so you started with Yu-Gi-Oh. what got you into Yu-Gi-Oh? so um it's a uh it's a funny story and uh, and of course we don't uh condone underage drinking but uh one of my uh one of my friends we were we were 15 i think sophomore year of high school and um one of my friends got got drowned uh, got grounded for for drinking and uh he he spent two weeks in his house doing nothing just bored no cell phone no tv and then uh he, he found his Yu-Gi-Oh cards uh, and uh, he brought them into school. And you know, when you're, when you're that young or, or I shouldn't even say that because I, I feel like I have this conversation with people every single time I bring up card games, but you mention a card game and then somebody in the room says, oh, I used to play, I had this card, I'm sure I can beat you. Um, so <laughs> that, was, uh, that was another one of my friends. And then our little group just went from hanging out in the mall or, or like, meeting up at, at our house to like play video games or something to like finding, finding Yu-Gi-Oh cards and then playing every single chance we got. Um, and, and I mean, every single chance we got. So like I, I went to school right by the Staten Island Ferry and we would meet up maybe like two hours before school started and then just like play on the floor and then wow. wait in between class breaks, play and play then go after school to the mall and then play then, and then go to, go to somebody's house and then play then. It's just, I, I don't know how it 
it happened, it was probably just our all of our competitive drives just going into over over year because it was the first time any of us have had had that uh that gaming experience and um we just ran with it now did you come from a background where you actually watched the television show the an the animated sh uh show i did yeah i think when it came out we were probably or i was probably like uh 11 or 12 and and it was on saturday morning uh every every day and then you would just you'd come home after school and you'd put it put it on and then uh hang uh hang up but like I knew about the game. I knew about other games like it because Pokemon was around then, Magic was around then. But I just, I always thought I was too cool to play them. But I obviously wasn't. <laughs> which, which is which is crazy because I think that speaks volumes of you know about people in general, myself included. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up. Um, I was your classic, uh, like your classic jock, especially when it got to middle school and high school. And I used to see kids um, playing magic and playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, some some a um, little bit of dabs of Pokemon, although it wasn't huge in the area I grew up in. It was Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, you know, you know, these are these are this like a nerdy thing. Like, you know, yeah. why don't they play like video games or why don't they even do sports? Yeah. And now I know, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> like I'm that nerd and not yeah. that I'm really big into CCGs, but it was just one of those things that, um, you know, I, I understand the attraction to it. Right. It's it, first of all, it's a competitive nature. So, you know, coming myself from, um, sports, you yeah. know, you have a competitive drive already built into you. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, what do you do? Like, I think the closest to me growing up until, you know, I was an adulthood playing dice masters and we'll get into mm -hmm. that shortly but the closest thing i got to like collectible card games was my younger brother who's 30 now mm -hmm. um wanted to collect pokemon cards because all his friends collected pokemon cards mm -hmm. so what i used to do is i used to hustle the younger younger kids <laughs> in the neighborhood um and i used to you know walk there was a, a card shop probably maybe two a mile and a half two miles from our house we would mm -hmm. walk together to the store yeah. um I would, you know, give them a couple bucks. We would purchase some packs, open them. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we just got to catch them all. It wasn't even about playing. It was just yeah. about collecting and catching them all. Yeah. And we, it's the same thing with like um, the actual video game. And you would link up the, um, the Game Boys. Mm -hmm. we, we would just, we would hustle kids out of those <laughs> as well. Like, like we, I, I want you to trade my Pokemon. I'm just going to give yeah. you a junk Pokemon and, you know, mm -hmm. I'll get, get your, you know, yeah. your, um, charge art or whatever the case may be but i know for me um you know i think we've spoken before I, w I was so against even when i got into the board gaming hobby i was super against the idea of collectible car games not that i didn't want to dabble or try them it was more mm -hmm. so for the fact of the the chase for the rare cards or sometimes the the most expensive card that you know it was expensive because it was such a good card to have in your deck and be competitive mm -hmm. um while i know that's probably the big, um, the big dr uh, drawback or the big turnoff for many people right. who have probably thought about getting into a collectible card game mm -hmm. is that I don't want to chase cards. But for myself, I didn't really know the one thing, the community aspect behind it. Yeah. Um, and Absolutely. also, yes. And also the, um, like you can actually play the game for from a casual standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. and just play it on a casual casual realm. So, yeah. you know, you and I got into, um, I played, I you know, I got into playing Dice Masters, and that was my rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, and then, like I said, I, I saw you at a shop where you drove down, getting mm -hmm. ready to prepare for. Um, I think it was a regional WKO yeah. we were going to be competing. So you came down just to get some competition. I had saw your name in an online tournament, mm -hmm. and I think you had made like the top four or top top eight cut or something like that. And I wasn't, I wasn't that same top eight, top four cut on that online, but mm -hmm. we never had matched up against each other. Mm -hmm. And we met at this, this tournament. I honestly came, I'm not going to lie. I came to scope what people were playing. That's Cause I knew some people, <laughs> I, I, I knew people were potentially going to be going to the WKO. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, this guy came all the way down from New York. I might be competing against this guy. So mm -hmm. I, my eyes, I'm not going to lie. I knew on my eyes were set on what you were playing. And what's funny <laughs> is you were playing a very a very similar deck to what I was actually trying to um, construct and what I was working on. And I was like, hmm, he has a similar play style. And I think 
after you played, I watched you play. You actually won that. It was a charity event that you had won. Yeah. I went I went out to my, to my car. I got my deck because we, we started talking mm -hmm. and then we, we started playing against each other. Yeah. And that's how we that's how we kind of sparked that conversation. Yeah. And then, you know, little, little, little do we know we played each other in a couple of different um, regionals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we're taking an eight hour trip to nationals all the way out in Ohio at Oregon. <laughs> So, um, yeah. do you remember driving home in the rain on the way back? And like, we had to, we literally had to stop the car because we couldn't see in front of us. And like, we were afraid we were flooding out. What was funny is that not only did we, we had to stop the car for a bit because of the rain, mm. it was so, the rain was so hard. I don't, if my wife listens to this episode, she's probably going to hear it for the first time. <laughs> she'll, be like, she'll be like, are you kidding me? I remember it, we just couldn't see the road that well. And we didn't understand mm -hmm. that the road had like where they must have been doing construction on one side. So there was like a drop off in the un uneven of the um, the yeah. pavement. And we were like, what was that sound? And we thought like we had a flat tire or something. And we, were kinda, <laughs> we had to double check it. And I was like, yeah. New one, I have to check this. My wife is going to kill me if I can't <laughs> or if she hears that I gotta I gotta tow this car. So um, yeah. but you know, babe, if you're listening, everything was good. We didn't mm -hmm. have any issues. Car um, <laughs> we were we were all we were all safe. But yeah, that was one of those things where we really understood what the comp like for me, that's the first time I went to something that was super heavy competitive. Like I started mm -hmm. out casual, you, you know, you find a game that you love and mm -hmm. you jump in. But, um, you know, little do we know we're at a nationals competing against some of the best competition in the world, yeah. let alone, of course, in the U.S., but there's some of the best competition in the world that was actually there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we talk about the big three. So Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they've been lasting. Of course, you know, Magic, the early 90s, mid 90s, that game yeah. has been out. Um, you know, it's continuously gets set rotations, things like that. There's multiple types of formats. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, it's, it's been around what, since the late nineties, early two thousands. I, I, yeah. I couldn't even tell you the dates. I'm not big on the Yu-Gi-Oh, um, IP. Mm -hmm. And then again, Pokemon, you know, prior on the same time, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, um, yeah. and they seem to stay the course, yeah. but we know that there's been so many other, um, collectible card type games that have come in out um like i said we've played dice masters it still has stuff coming out printing for it but there's these the new kids on the block yeah you know flesh and blood um mm -hmm. now you know you were telling me not too long ago a new digimon card game there was a transformers card game mm -hmm. um we had my friend brian on the show not too long ago who was talking about he got into it with the star wars um ccg then yeah. that that died off Mm -hmm. What is it that is not letting these other games last? Are the Powerhouse 3 just so good? Or is it the fact that there's something that these games are missing when it comes to maybe a marketing aspect or maybe is it a, a money aspect? I think it's it's a combination of all of it. So Magic started in, what, like 1993 or something like that. And it, it did take a while to to get to its like its its peak point. And even now, people start. People are starting to say that it's dying, dying down little by by little. But we're still talking about a player base of millions of people, like millions yes. upon millions of people. And um, uh, I think Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon, and uh, there are a few other like honorable mentions there. Um, they're they're almost at a point where they're too big to fail. Where if they if they continue to to have dedicated product coming out. Um, these these smaller like indie games that are trying to like make their way into the scene just have a very difficult time uh competing one uh because card games or, or like physical card games are dependent on stores willing to support them and people are only gonna people stores are only going to support the cards that are going to sell and they know magic is going to sell they know you Yu Yu-Gi-Oh is going to sell they know pokemon's going to sell each and every time no matter how much product comes out um so uh i think having a having a really really good launch is important and if not critical like make a break for these games uh to to even stand a chance against a big three uh and if they fail out on that um it's it's been difficult and we've seen it in games that we love uh die off little by little even if they start off really really strong uh if they if they don't have enough to to compete they don't like keep their foot on the gas then uh people go back to magic people go back to Yu-Gi-Oh. um it's just kind of the the way of the game <laughs> 
Yeah, which is which is sad in a sense because there are some great games that oh, are yeah. there. There's there's some great games that are currently on the market. I know that sure. you know, and but for me, I know um, it's one of those things like I find it hard for me to get into a game while I enjoyed the competitive aspect of of but just going into something like magic or Yu-Gi-Oh because I know the player base is so large. Mm-hmm. I know that if I was getting into a game of that magnitude um that it's like there's a power creep where you know everybody has this hu- they're almost like they have a huge advantage because they know the card pool. The card mm-hmm. pool is so large. It's like if you were to step into that realm, you have to first pick a a format that you want to play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to me, it's almost that point like, yeah, I, I don't know if I can dedicate the time to it. Um, and I do, you know, I, I'm the type of person who would, who would love to get in when a game is fresh, when it's new, yeah. because you can grow with the game. And that's how it happened with dice masters for mm-hmm. me, you know, and you know, you and I competing on, we're able to compete on, on national levels and qualify yeah. for worlds and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were able to grow with those cards, to grow yeah. with the game and see how the meta worked and 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 what was the top cards out there, but also be able to manipulate things and bring out something new and fresh that maybe people weren't playing or mm-hmm. play twist on what people were playing, which made the game new and refreshing. Yeah. Um, but you and I had got into another game. Actually, it was something that I, I told myself, I'm not going to really get into a, a heavy card game, but I found something that I knew that my brother was interested in. Mm-hmm. I have a, a, my youngest brother um, who at the time I think was uh, f- maybe 15, about mm-hmm. 15 years old. Yeah, and yeah. he, he always wanted to play magic and stuff like that. But for him, it was the same thing. Like it's just too, there's too much going on too many cards. Yeah. I don't know where to start. So I saw this game called Light Seekers, and it was at the same origins that we were competing um, for Dice Masters Nationals. And mm-hmm. um, our buddy Isaac over at Gaming with Sidekicks had mm-hmm. t- just put it in my ear. Hey, you, you should check this out. I, I was demoing it over at the, the table. Mm-hmm. Check this one out. So I got home. I researched it, and I really liked it because I bought some of the starter decks. And the first person I had called or texted was you mm-hmm. hey i said hey check this out because i know you love card games no matter what it is you're mm-hmm. always willing to check it out yeah. um but what's funny is that when you go to check it out you dive in again I head know. first <laughs> into the deep <laughs> section <laughs> <laughs> yeah light seekers was uh and and uh, and you can uh, you you can probably attest to this it, it was my favorite card game uh that i played of all the ccgs it's it's definitely number one on my list um, but it was so, it was so new, and the barrier of entry was so low. I thought, where like you can figure out how to play a competitive deck without spending hundreds of dollars, and it was the first game that I I, I got into that was like that. And I just figured, this is this is my chance. This is how I can. This is where I can see how deep I can actually go into it. So like all of last year, I I traveled pretty much across the country. Uh, playing in tournaments trying to trying to work my my way up and actually finished rank one last year um and it was it was amazing getting to getting to go from like the, my usual casual place in Yu-Gi-Oh where I was where I was spending uh to make a good deck in Yu-Gi-Oh even if it's not like your number one deck you're still spending a few hundred dollars at least to build out your core um yes. but in in light seekers i was winning tournaments making 40 dollar decks uh cheaper if anything yeah and um it was it was fantastic to to see that happen or or to be a part of that and getting to travel around the entire country and meeting people that are playing this game loving this game uh helping build out a community was really what made it for me i thought I, i i made friendships there that i'll i'll take with me to the grave and I, I love the game for that, especially. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for that game specifically, I know it was one that I really fell in love with. Like I said, it was something that was, e- it was easy, easy entry, not only just mm-hmm. price wise, but mm-hmm. easy to understand the concepts, the mechanics. And I think for me, it was the perfect game to start off as coming in at the entry level as it was new to grow mm-hmm. with, you know, what the, what the card lingo is, all that stuff mm-hmm. and follow how the mechanics of the game worked And as it grew and it, I'm sad to see that the whole game went completely digital, yeah. um, you know, because it was a great game, you know, and, you know, 
And I know Nuon will not toot his own horn, but you know Nuon was not only the best player in the country, probably the best player in the world. I would say definitely when it came to that, because this game, the company who made this game is from the UK, and you know Nuon, the decks that you were putting out, the people in the UK were trying to replicate them and beat them, and they were still talking off in every Discord channel that you know they just don't know how how they could how they could do it or how you even managed to come up with the concept, which was I think incredible um Thank you. but you know but when you look at things like magic you know you have guys who have been in the game since the beginning who are still doing it who have made careers out of games like mm-hmm. this right um when you have when you're in the big three people yeah. can make careers making money and stuff like that i think um you know whether it's going sometimes companies going hard or going too hard or just trying to win my sense like with um light seekers maybe mm-hmm. trying to get trying to get too new or trying to get too revolutionary that they kind of shoot their own selves in the foot you know Mm -hmm. not that not that the digital thing wasn't great but i felt like personally the digital thing got them away from the actual physical game and what the physical game could have grown into i'm not saying that it would have been in taking any of these big three off like you said because it's one of those things they're the big three it's going to sell and you made a very good point you said that um these card games last because first off it's the communities that need to be built to keep them going. And Mm -hmm. one thing is having stores that are willing to bring the communities in. And I know that's the most challenging personally for me. I know that was the most challenging thing that I um, ran into is because Mm -hmm. stores sometimes before they will want the product, you run into stores who want the community first. They're like, okay, who can you bring in to play this game for me to even stock it on my shelves? Yeah. And while I think that is um, is sometimes needed, I think sometimes there has to be a point where it's like, if you can make it available, mm-hmm. let you can build the community from there. Mm-hmm. And I think people will eventually come. It's not going to start, you know, it has to start off small because I think that's how the big, the big ones did it. Right. But I think when it comes to, from a, from a business model, many people are afraid to jump in and say, yeah, we'll back this product. We'll carry this product because um, we'll help you build a community. And sometimes um, that's not the case. And yeah. this is not, this is not a knock on any stores or anything yeah. like that across the country, because this is something that we see everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen communities of dice masters, dwindle mm-hmm. down to a couple players especially here in the state of new jersey where um whiz kids is from you know we had had smaller scenes at one point we had big scenes but then we at one point we were the one of the smaller scenes throughout the entire state and the company i mean throughout the country and this company comes from new jersey you yeah. would think that stores would be more willing to you know accept back. the product mm-hmm. back the product but it, it was crazy because yeah. it was hard mm-hmm. to find product in the store um yeah. so you you talked about your favorite ccgs i want to get into your top five because before the before we got um the show i told you hey put together a list of your top five collectible card games and sure. whether the reasons if you had any honorable mentions that might have missed the cut mm-hmm. the, the the floor is yours nuan what is your number five Got it. Uh, so uh, funny that uh, I started off the conversation saying that uh, games will have a very, very difficult time uh, beating out Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon, but Magic the Gathering is actually my number five. And um, it's uh, I, I, I literally try to get my hands on every single card game I can play, uh, even if it's just getting a couple of starter decks. Um, and, and you know, you know me every once in a while, that means like buying out somebody's entire collection, trying to figure <laughs> out if I can, if I can make the meta, um, out of it. But, um, magic, I, have been playing since I was, uh, I don't know, maybe like 2021. 20, I, I found it. Um, I got my hands on cards for the first time while I was in college, a couple of my friends, um, in the same program that I was, uh, I was in in school, uh, started playing, and I was already um, familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh. I already tried my hands at playing very heavy and competitive in Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, but um, you can you can tell when you when you pick up a, a Magic deck why it's it's probably the number one game in the world, the number one collectible card game in the world, and and why it's going to remain that remain in its place. It's just it's it's perfectly balanced. If you pay attention to how how tournaments work, it um, they they built out a model or, or kind of like a card ecosystem where you are forced to 
continue to buy into their product. You want to be a part of their events. You want to be uh, there for pre-releases. And I've I've been to my fair share of Magic pre-releases where I'm, I'm waiting in line at a store um, for a midnight opening and we play a tournament all the way into the morning. Um, there's a there's a culture in Magic that is just so strong and so dominant compared to all of these other games that um, it's kind of infectious and you want to be a part of it if you like collectible card games. Um, that being said, uh, mechanic-wise, it, it only makes the list at number five. Um, it, it was a good entry into non-Yu-Gi-Oh games for me, but um, I think um, just based on my liking of, of, of certain games and how they play, just it barely made the list. And it's just, yeah. it's funny to think when it's it's the most popular game in the world. Gotcha, awesome. So on to your number four. Okay, and this is a this is a new one. Uh, very very new um, uh, on the scene. I think it only released last year. Um, but Flesh and Blood. Um, it's a, a game out of uh, New Zealand, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I actually had the the privilege when they were trying to to make a presence in in the states. Uh, the creator came over and he uh, he joined a tournament in uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, so uh, the the game hadn't officially really come out. Uh, the uh, the packs were just available, um, and he he came over and um, he he played in a tournament with us. And uh, Flesh and Blood. Uh, I don't know if you if, if if you guys want to like if you look at any game that we talk about today, I think you should really take a take a look at Flesh and Blood and what they're doing. Uh, and of all the games that have been coming out, I think that has the best chance for longevity um, to really, like 20 years down the line, we can we can see people playing Flesh and Blood in a, in a, in a local store. Um, they did such a great job with their launch. It was, I, I was very impressed. And I've been, I've been watching card games and, and watching them grow, watching them build out for the last 15 years. And Flesh and Blood did the best launch I've seen. Wow. Yeah. Don't get me interested, Nuan. Come on. <laughs> the problem is that it was marketed so well, uh, and they they came off the bat saying, we want you to be a part of this with us. We want to build out a community. We're making a limited print of the first set, and the people that are involved in this first set are are going to have a special product. And they had such a limited printing of this first of this first box that now an unopened box of flesh and blood for a game that came out last year is going for like a thousand dollars. Wow. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and a year ago I bought maybe like three or four boxes for like $70 a pop. Uh, and I opened them. I shouldn't have, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I, I honestly think that that game's going to do really well and do, do well for a long time. Uh, and it's fun. Um, there's, uh, a different different mechanic or a different play style than any of the other games on the market. Uh, similar to if you know Magic well, um, they have this like uh, commander format where you pick a hero and then you basically have to like knock out the hero, not just like win the game. Um, and uh, that's similar to Lightseekers. There are other games that are that are just like that, but the 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 hero himself is the one that's actually fighting. And all of the cards in your deck are just moves that the hero are doing. So like different like fighting melee attacks and things like that. It's a really interesting twist on um, the the CCG battleground or or like the field that you play. Because when you when you think about normalizing all of the card games in the space, all of them fit a certain mold. Um, different cards, different mechanics, different engines that that make the deck work. But like you have like a base model. We have a, a field, you have cards in your hand, and then you have to make the best uh, of the field that you have in play. So, like, there's a uh, limited amount of moves you can do, a limited amount of cards you can play in a certain turn. Um, but all of them kind of have that same feeling. Uh, Flesh and Blood was very unique in that sense. It was, uh, it was just, like, one guy in the field duking it out against another, another guy. And also, like, the games that you play were so exciting. Like I, I played like I thought I played really well when I went to a tournament, and I did not know whether or not I was going to win till like that last turn. Um, 
and it's it's fun to play a game like that because nobody wants to like sit there for 30 minutes while somebody toolboxes through a turn and then wins without you being able to do anything gotcha. but um, it was fun yeah i liked it check it out <laughs> flesh and blood so nuance nuance given the nod flesh yeah. and blood check that out all right number three new one number three is star wars destiny and unfortunately it got sunset last year um last year or earlier this year um but they are no longer making physical cards um star wars destiny is an interesting uh collection piece because it's it's a combination kind of just like dice masters it's a combination of cards and a deck and dice um, so you're you're actually playing and, and, and building out a combat system with dice, so it's not just cards. Um, but if you are uh, a fan of Star Wars in general, um, it, it dives heavy into all of the movies, all of the shows, uh, characters that you wouldn't normally see. It, it kind of makes you want to, if you play it for the first time, I feel like you're going to want to like Star Wars, even if you're not a big Star Wars fan. Um, I actually, when I started playing Star Wars, I... Um, uh, I bought a new copy of all of the movies. I bought some books. I was really trying to get into like Star Wars lore and the game really sucked me in. Um, gotcha. I thought that was very cool. Um, very fun. Uh, similar kind of issues. Uh, it was really, really nice and big in its heyday. You had these giant, like a couple of hundred people tournaments that were, that were running on like the national scene. People were traveling for these big tournaments. And then uh, eventually it just, um, it just fizzled and i don't know if it was they couldn't get product out or uh, people were just weren't playing the way that they used to but um it's the unfortunate uh, effect of being a non-magic non-yugioh non-pokemon game uh it's it's going to be hit or miss and uh most of the time it's a miss yeah yeah i have my i have my uh my personal opinions on that game, not the fact of uh, the fact that it wasn't good. I didn't honestly jump into it because I wasn't a huge Star Wars fan. Mm. Um, I am a big Star Wars fan now, and I'll <laughs> tell you, it wasn't if if the Mandalorian came out back then, mm -hmm. I would probably have been playing Destiny. And for me, huh. uh, the Mandalorian is the reason that I got into wanting to follow the Star Wars lore, the Star Wars canon was simply mm -hmm. because I was like, oh, let's, let me try this Star Wars TV show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody's saying you don't have to pretty much know the the lore, have seen the movies to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is really good, but I have to figure out what's what else there is about this, about this world. Mm -hmm. And I got into it. Um, but for me, I think it's personally for me with that game, it was a, a, a company issue. Okay. Um, FF, FFG fantasy flight for those that don't know what that means. Fantasy flight games. Um, while I love some of the games that they do put out, I can tell you when it comes to their, their, ccg with like that and some mm -hmm. of their L lcgs which is a living card game it's not collectible yeah. meaning you can buy a set and you're gonna get the same thing as the next person who buys that set mm -hmm. um i feel like they they make really good card games and then they just shoot them in the foot um yeah. it's almost like let's let's get it out really quick let's make a lot of money and then um let's move on to the next one and i think personally that's kind of how they did it um they could that game could have been marketed a whole lot better um not that it wasn't it mm -hmm. had the IP behind it. It was a great game from everyone that I've, I've yeah. known who has played it. Um, but I just think they just let it fall by the wayside because they were looking for the next big money maker. That's just me. Um, yeah. yeah. So obviously, I, I, I know I'm not going to get the, the a, a like on this from FFG. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm 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 here to be honest. I'm not here to um, to win votes. And you know, for me, honestly, it's about being honest with the community, and that's that's how I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, Nuan, on to your number two. Yeah, uh, and this is this is how I met you, Jazz. It's, it's Dice Masters. Yeah, it's um, I, 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 and this is and and maybe this is is how you can tell whether or not I, I like a game when you when you think about like the the actual moment you decided to start playing it. But uh, uh, when I found Dice Masters, I was still very very heavy on my um in my wanting to be uh, competitive while playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, so I, uh, I was in the city, I came across a com comic book shop and, and I, I feel like I'm the, uh, the level of nerdy where I can appreciate superheroes or comic books, even though I don't actually read any, but, uh, I walked in, uh, went in to check to see if they have any, uh, any Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And then I found the, uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh starter set for Dice Masters. 
and like right then and there i took my phone out looked to see what this game was watched a quick video and i was just like all right i have to give this a shot um so i i bought the starter deck and i just thought it was fantastic um and it's it was such a fun game and you you think about Dice Masters away from Yu-Gi-Oh! or just like all of the IP that it had and like all of the different combinations that you had of, of just building out building out a fun team with characters that you knew from when you were younger and and putting them all together. It was it was just a fantastic idea and I, I wanted to be a part of it. And I the it's it's funny that I, I got into Dice Masters around the time that the the community started dwindling down. Yes. Uh, so I I wanted to be on the tournament scene. I wanted to see what it was like to compete, but I had to travel two hours to get to a local store that supported it. Um, yeah. So I, I drove all the way from New York City to, to South Jersey uh, to Top Deck Games. Um, great store, by the way, if, if there are any listeners out there. But um, but uh, that was the only place that I can play. And yeah. there was no no place in New York that I knew of that I that I can buy product. Um, I, unless I went online, but, uh, I, I wish I, I could have been there from the, from the get-go to play Dice Masters and really like be a part of that, that first rush. But I enjoyed every tournament that I went to, all the WKOs that we went to that I lost most of to you, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was a really, really great experience and it's a fun game. Honestly, like. If you if you're gonna spend and we can we can talk about price because that's really cost comes down to the barrier of entry of any game now if you if if we really want to like think about why why some of these games are gonna suffer or why you when you when you make the decision between magic or something else you go magic um, but if you spend, if you can spend twenty dollars on trying a new game, and you want to just have some fun with your friends, I would recommend Dice Masters. Yes, I, I, that's what I was going to say. I know with Dice Masters, it's one of those things that um, you know my my friend Judge, who, who uh, is on this podcast with me, um, he said, "Hey, I want to get into a CCG. I used to play Magic when I was in high school or in middle school. Um, you know what is out? What is there that's out there?" I says, "Oh, I've heard about this new game called Dice Masters." Um, but I don't even deal with collectible stuff, so you can check it out. Mm-hmm. And I was teaching him about board games, and he's, I remember the next day he he watched the video on YouTube. I had seen it, but I was like, I'm just not going to get into it. Yeah. Um, watch a video on YouTube. He told me he picked up the, the first two starter decks, and I felt like I was obligated to buy them just because, you know, just so he had someone to play with. Mm-hmm. We, we sat down in our church, um, like, uh, overflow room one night when we did like a little a game gathering with friends mm-hmm. and my wife was teaching pandemic to some to some of our friends and I was playing dice masters and after the just the the very basic um, you know just four characters versus four characters um, and just you know your two basic actions out there we played that game and to see how close the game was and how tight it was i said all right this game is really good so it's like oh let me just see what other stuff i can go out there and buy and buy a couple packs and stuff went on ebay found some people selling their sets got in dirt cheap i pretty much got like the first two complete sets for like a hundred bucks um and it was over from there Mm -hmm. i said how do we how do we start a community i worked on helping build a community down here in south jersey had one of the first stores um running running events Mm -hmm. and it was and we started just building from there but like i said um while it is a game that it did die out um north jersey probably had the biggest scene you know players of you know going to tournaments of 50 60 65 people or drove down to maryland for like another 60 70 um player tournament but a game that was really good on IP. So if you were big on like superheroes, Marvel superheroes, and they went into DC superheroes, um, you know, they had something for everyone. Now they have the WWE. Um, but 
for those that are listening, if you've ever thought of collecting, getting into a collectible game, but you just were like, hey, I just want to play it casually, um, Dice Masters is definitely the game that you could do it because you can just buy a, a starter set or, or buy a starter set in a few packs. Have fun. You don't even have to worry about building something competitive. Just build teams with your favorite. I just want to build an all X-Men team or an all um, Justice League team or all villains team. You can do that and have fun and compete against something else and just really really enjoy the game um that's what i think was unique about this game and i really really wish um that there was a surgence of first of all the company helping support it a little bit stronger um and and how they run events and how they um release product because i think that really did hurt it from a standpoint on where they wanted to go but um you know if there are if there are stores that we're also willing to support it more and hold on. Cause I know in the very, very beginning um, there were stores that were super reluctant on carrying this game and pay, people were asking about it and they said, Oh, it's not um, the big three. So uh, we're just not going to run with it. And cool. I've, I ran to a store that the owner was really big on superheroes. He said, yeah, let's, let's try it. And it, it turned into a big, a big thing. Um but yeah, I would check out Dice Masters. Um, I know people are saying that it's it's trying to make a resurgence in a competitive nature. Um, but this is one of those things where if you do want a competitive scene, you can easily um, go on to a Dice Masters. Uh, it's, it's called the Dice Masters Unlimited page on Facebook. Um, you get linked up with some other groups. There's a Discord out there. And there are competitive, I'm talking about top level competition oh, yeah. online with um, with prize support, things like that, um, that are just online events. So the community is awesome. The people within the community have made it awesome. Um, and they've put together good videos, how to plays, how to play with your webcam, all these different things to play against other people, which has kept the game alive. And I think this game is loved by so many people that it will stay, it will stay around simply because of the community. Um, so Nuon, your last one, your number one, I think you've mentioned it, but let's, let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> number one is light seekers for sure. I use my, uh, my, my light seekers mat actually as my mouse pad for computers, uh, for my, for my work. So I, I think about light seekers all the time still, uh, even though I haven't played in such a, uh, a, a while, uh, I really haven't played since last year's competitive season. Um, but the barrier entry is so low, uh, like so low that like I I was at a I was at a, a convention, Pax Unplugged, and we were trying to teach uh, like a five year old, uh, like a little five year old girl, how to play, and she picked it up so quickly. And, oh, yeah, yeah, like better than better than some of the adults that were there. I thought, and the the artwork is like kid accessible. Um, the Gameplay can get as complicated as you want it to be. Um, so, like any game that can support like an infinite loop um, in its in its strategy, I think is is complicated enough where like you don't have to worry about it just being like a like a children's game. Um, the the product was fun. The game was fun. Everything about it, um, especially especially the community, because. Uh, I just I met some great people playing this game, and everyone was nice. You 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 run into a like a magic tournament, and because people are spending so much money, and I think that all of this really comes down to money. But like, if you spend so much money on a game and you wanna you wanna play in these tournaments, you're 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 just playing to win. I feel like at that point you're almost not having a good time, uh, and you're so kind of like beaten up about not winning um but it was not like that in any city that i've played light seekers in. and i went uh where did i go where did i travel i uh I, I played in texas and uh in michigan and ohio and indiana all over the place um and every single community was fantastic and like we would go out after after the tournaments and like nobody cared nobody talked about light seekers while we were hanging out we were like just drinking beers and getting along and uh the game really brought all of that together like when when else would i have gotten to meet like an amazing couple from ohio or like a, a great store owner from indiana like it's just um 
it was a it was a perfect experience and i got to even if it was in like a little microcosm and it wasn't like millions of players i got to experience playing like high level high level tournaments um even even like nationally recognizable tournaments but still still feeling uh like i was just having fun and it wouldn't have mattered if i won or lost i thought that was great and i um if i never play light seekers again and i i continue to play card games it'll still be my favorite card game forever yeah and i think that's that's one thing i, I, I did enjoy light seekers i have them flip-flopped of course um mm. my my top five is probably like light seekers light seekers dice masters dice masters dice masters because i've never <laughs> played any of the other ones <laughs> um, like i i have like magic starter decks but um I feel like, uh, you know, under, reading the verbiage and all that other stuff, just, I don't know, to me, I, I don't know if I just want to put the time in. Um, yeah. I best, you know, investing so much time in, you know, Dice Masters, which that was my thing. You know, while I en- really heavily enjoy board games, that's my thing now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when I got into the competitive scene of playing Dice Masters, it did pull me away from board games for a while. Because, I you know, it was, you know, when you're playing competitively, it's about, it, it, you do want to win. You know, Mm -hmm. that's the competitive nature. But like you said, for me, it was about community, Um, being able to sit across from someone and whether they were young, whether they were old, same age. But after winning or losing, um, being able to just talk strategy with that person, um, Mm -hmm. you know, as as many people I know that have played other games, that doesn't normally happen in a community. It's like you lost, you know, get away from me. I'm I'm on to my next one here. And in that community was different when I played light seekers a little bit slightly competitive because i just went to like two or three tournaments that you talked me into same thing um and it was one of those things that you know for me i was trying to understand building a a a 10 card deck in dice masters as opposed to building a a 30 card deck in light seekers i couldn't even imagine a 60 card deck in in magic like i don't know the you know what what's the ratio of what cards you need in your deck like that's where for me i think it was it was understanding that stuff and i don't know if i wanted to put the time in um, yeah. but i didn't but i did enjoy it um from a from a casual standpoint which is good but new one i really enjoy your list so um for those that are listening yeah these are some um some ccgs to check out but there are others out there there are um, you know, I think, I don't know if the Transformers game was out there. There's a Digimon that just released. There's always something and it's, it's for whatever you want to get into. Um, I did mention the living card games, which are, if you're not into about collecting stuff and, and trying to chase, you know, the rare cards or the, or the, that expensive card, um, you can just get into living card games or some people, um, some other companies don't have what you would say that don't have to use that term. They use, um, I forget what, what they use, uh, but they just use a regular card game. I know, for example, one that's re-releasing um, that's coming out is called Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born, mm-hmm. which I know that had a really big cult following when it came out. It was it was very much loved. There was some support that dropped off, but that one's now starting to pick up. And some I think what happens with some of these games is, you know, trying to figure out what, which game is going to catch on. But this one is going to be getting a, a, like a, a revision coming out. Um, so this yeah. is one to check out. So those people that are listening, if maybe it's not something you want to get into from a competitive standpoint, definitely check some of these out for even for a casual standpoint, it's good to have like this dueling match against a, an opponent, whether it's a, your, your son or daughter or your best friend or your spouse across the table, you know, you have that competitive nature. And what's good is that you can buy some of these starter decks, even if you're not into board games and just play and have that competitive, you know, one-on-one nature but um you know there's there's that that crossover i know there's a lot of people who are, have have left the ccg world and have met people who are in the board gaming realm and they started to take to board gaming or vice versa people who have played board games and like hey let me check out these competitive card games because you're at a card shop or, or, or a game store a hobby shop and you're seeing people from different walks of life different hobbies that are coming together around a table and conversation happens and new things are discovered um you know and i think that's uh, that's what happens i think sometimes there are what i would say those uh cc i guess 
from board gamers, they would say that there's these CCG snobs, I mm-hmm. guess, sometimes, you know, where, oh, we only play CCGs. We don't play board games. We're only here to play Magic, or we're only here to play Pokemon, wherever the case may be. Like, we don't get into board gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there are those people, but there's also those same people, like I said, that are on the board gaming spectrum. Like, oh, yeah, we don't get into that. That was kind of like me. Not that I was, like, necessarily a snob, but I just didn't want to get into the collectible aspect of it, because it is, with some of these, I know for Magic, it can be a, a, a money drain, you mm-hmm. know, having, because there's because the games are so good um you want to if you have that competitive nature you want to be competitive you want to do all these things but you know that is um that's the part of us the ccgs but being the board gaming guy i wanted to ask you (laughs) you said yeto you mentioned yeto nuan mentioned yeto being his number one all-time favorite game and we this past uh year to 2019 pax unplugged um Nuan drove down to the Philly area. We went met at PAX Unplugged, and I said, "Why don't you bring Yeto?" Um, there is a current Kickstarter online, and I think I texted him when when I saw, saw about this Kickstarter being released. And I said, "I've heard you rave about this game. I want to try it. Let's play it. Bring bring your copy, and then this will let me know if I want to back this deluxe edition." Um, I played it and fell in love one hundred percent. It's in my collection. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, with COVID, I haven't been able to play a lot of my bigger games. And with a wife being in, you know, her in grad school, um, who is my main person that I game with, getting mm-hmm. heavy out just doesn't work. But yeah. uh, her last her last finals tomorrow, so this uh, uh, this yeah. <laughs> Christmas, Christmas break will be good getting some of these games. But it's one of those things that if you are um, a fan of something like Lords of Waterdeep and enjoy a game like that, which is an, what many people say is a great entry level game into the hobby, especially about worker placement, mm-hmm. but you want something with a little bit more, a little bit more meat on it, but also sometimes a little bit more player interaction. Like uh, some, sometimes take that. Um, I know a lot of people were big, heavily turned off from Yeto because it does have a, can have a heavy take that element. Mm-hmm. Um, the new deluxe edition um, has these modes that you can actually um, have that take that element or dial it down where it can be less, less take that in the game, um, which is, I know that for me, that was a huge attraction to this deluxe edition because I know there's some people that I sit down at a table with that are very, very against like take that games. Don't mm-hmm. mess with what I'm doing. I want to work on my strategy and I don't want you to in my last turn or last round completely throw off everything that I was doing. And for me on a standpoint, I kind of, I understand where that's coming from. Yeah. Um, but yeah, new one. I just want to, I just want to thank you or I just want to blame you for me having to add that game to my collection because <laughs> it's very good. It's beautiful. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, re- I recently unboxed mine and I'm loving it. Uh, <laughs> I just, I think I just going to set it up on the table one day, push some pieces around just like, yeah. but it does have a solo mode, but I'm going to be honest. Yeah. I haven't had the time to sit down and put a nice big game on the table for solo, but um, yeah. definitely going to be checking it, checking it out soon. Yeah. We're, I feel like we're, we're kind of on the opposite end of, end of the spectrum there. Cause I love, take that kind of games and it might be the the CPG player in me, but like, I feel like if there's a game that has like a, a, an element of sabotage into it, um, uh, where a player is thinking that they're winning, but you have some sort of like secret hand or, or something that you're going to do, that's really going to, uh, mess them over towards the end of the game. Um, I feel like I thrive in, in games like that. Um, and, and Yeto, and that's part of the reason why I like Yeto so much. I've, I've played games where, I've played games of Yeto where I was up 20 points um, and I, I still lost at the end of the game just because of, of how, how much can turn based on like a, a couple of factors that you didn't account for. And it really makes you want to, to like analyze every aspect of the game. And we've, and I've done it at, at least, I think I've gone through as much as I can with this game, like literally like reading every single card um, playing by myself, pretending that I have other p other other friends willing to play <laughs> me. Like I, um, I really try to to be the best Yeto player that I could be, and it's not it's not that much of a competitive game. It's just you bring it out on the table and you you play for an hour and then it's done. You know, like, there's no yeah. like, going back to the game. Um, and I I feel like it got to the point where people just didn't want to play anymore and and you don't want to have that kind of uh game group uh 
either. So uh, one of my friends and I, we actually, uh, we got together and we sat down and we thought about how we can challenge ourselves uh, to lose, but lose to the best of our ability to keep people interested in playing with us. So like we would we would go harder, we would like play harder routes or make like alternate versions of the game uh, and make it very, very difficult for us to win and allow other people to get just as, as invested in this game or in any of these games that, that we play um, as we are. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good strategy or a good thing to keep in mind when you're when you're hosting a, a board game night. Um, you're mo- if, if it's your game and you know the rules and no one else knows how to play, you're more than likely going to win. Um, so if you want to keep, if you want people like interested in playing or interested in coming back, um, you uh, you got to make it uh, fair or take away your home court advantage, I guess. You you made a good point there. Now I want to ask you: When you taught me this game, did you do that because I won? <laughs> so, I I need I need to know now. It's an I need to know. You know, Maria <laughs> asked me the same question when we were going back to the hotel room uh, about whether or not I let you win, and I, you know, I don't I don't think I did. I I probably didn't play the way I'd normally play, if that means anything. All right, that means we got to play again. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I definitely can see because here, you know, at the lobby hobbies, the idea is introducing people to stuff that you want them to kind of get into. Um, and we had a, an episode about how do you get casual gamers into the hobby? Um, you know, your wife is very very casual. You know, yeah. my my wife is a casual player. She's very competitive. She mm-hmm. does like to play a game over and over until she masters the strategy. That's just her. Um, and that's something she recently told me. I, I she says I don't like playing. I don't like when you want to play. Um, you know, 10 different games over the course of a weekend because I'm still trying to figure out the different strategies in game one. She says, I would prefer to play that one game 10 times. And for me, while I enjoy a game, mm-hmm. I just like I just like different experiences. Yeah. Um, that's that's just how I, I, I am. Mm-hmm. But she has the competitive nature. She says, she says, when I sit down on the table, my main goal is to win. Mm-hmm. And um, I think she does. She does have times where she'll dial it down. I know she never lets me win. I know that. <laughs> um, but having a, a wife who was a casual gamer, and what's funny is I say casual gamer now because your wife was not really a gamer. She was right. the person who did not want to play a game. So right. obviously, I, I believe COVID has kind of changed that. But how is that now? What have you, for the listeners that are out there that have a spouse or someone who is really not into it or will play light games, but now from from what you have told me, your wife has been open to trying out um newer games, more strategic style games. So what was the transition? Was it just COVID or was it, was it something um, th- that, that helped out? So uh, the part of it was just that she, our, our quarantining or our like extra layer of safety of precautions that we're taking over or by her design. And she wanted me to be, I guess, like happy in the house and like, not go crazy because I think part of um, part of my enjoyment of board games and card games, even though like they're every once in a while, especially at these big tournaments, there uh, there's a big mental strain uh, and it's 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 almost exhausting. Like you're playing a game that you love, at, but at the end of the day, you're wiped because you're you're using so much of your uh, of your faculties that you're just you're you're done after a tournament. Um, but it's a nice escape for me from thinking about all that I have to do for work or, or like um, just uh, everything else. So even as as like stressful as it is, it's a, it's an it's an escape. But like with COVID, uh, like we're literally uh, waking up, going to the desk, and we're working, and we work until it's time to go to sleep. So like you you kind of lose that um, that escape of everything else, even if it's just commuting for an hour a day or, or like going outside to get like an energy drink from the store or something like that. Uh, it's just not there anymore. So I think she was, she was really aware of, of me needing some sort of, uh, activity that wasn't, that wasn't working, that, um, was something that I can do that I can enjoy. So she, she's been playing a lot of games with me. Also, she's been, uh, very upset about how many games I've bought since we've been home 
because all I my my pile of games is literally I'm I, I keep looking over to the to the right, but the pile of games is literally right next to me. And whenever I see something, it it kind of triggers something in me to want to look for more board games. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I know that feeling. <laughs> you know, honestly, like the collection really started taking a turn for the worse in terms of me adding more because right after I went to your house, I saw your your wall or your little shrine of games behind you, and I just I wanted it for myself because I think before I before before we went on that trip and then I saw your game collection, I probably had about like like 30 to 35 board games um, in the house. And that's a decent sized collection. Uh, yeah, so it is. It's not terrible, but now um, I'm hitting like 140. Um, so like, and that, it hasn't been that long. It's been probably like two years since I saw your house. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's it, it's crazy because I think for me I probably had about uh, I've I've counted um, maybe like three hundred something games come through my collection, uh-huh. um, but I try to keep it at about a about about one fifty. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is, you know, many people are listening like, oh wow, that's a lot of games. Um, you know, when you talk to some people in the community mm-hmm. in the hobby, that's on the average I would say because. Um, you know, and the people say, well, how are you going to play 150 games? It's not about for me personally about having 150 games. Mm-hmm. It's about having something that's going to meet various people. Yeah. Um, for me, it's about the community aspect of playing games, getting together at a table with somebody um, and someone saying, hey, what's your interest? Are you into this or what are you into? And I can I can look at my shelf and say, OK, you might like this. Why don't you try this? And and mm-hmm. no. And then once, and I always start on the lighter end. Mm-hmm. And once they're starting to really enjoy games, you know, for me, my wife has told me, and we'll probably talk about this in a little later episode. I'll probably bring her on is my biggest mistake is I teach someone a game and mm-hmm. I want to teach them another game. Mm-hmm. And I think she's told me is that sometimes that might turn people off, which I'm, I, it was an eye opener because I'm like, Oh wow. Why don't they don't want to play anything else with me? Like, did they not like it? She said, um, no, everybody that everybody sat at the table. I think they've been genuinely honest that they've liked it, but they probably want to continue playing it more. And if you let them play the game more, mm-hmm. um, they might start to dive deeper into the hobby for themselves. Um, and I know that's one thing, especially when I play two, two games that are too light mm-hmm. over and over, they become just redundant. Not the fact that they're just too light, but my mind is looking for something a little bit on the more strategic end. Um, but, you know, we can, I have, I have family members who can play 30 and two hours of happy salmon, which is like a five minute game. Uh-huh. It doesn't take that long and they will play that to death. And, you know, or they'll want to play, you know, five to six straight games of, you know, 20 people werewolf and it's like and of course i get stuck being the narrator for for those games like three hours later i'm like i really didn't play anything but (laughs) but as a but as a hobbyist Mm -hmm. it's good to understand that it's important to introduce people if you want to get them into your hobby you got to find what they like Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this before is find what they like get them into it and you know get them immersed where they start asking you for that stuff. But what's important that you mentioned Nuan, was um, you were talking about, you know, have being in a good headspace, like mentally, Mm -hmm. which is important. I think, especially with COVID, we talk about this. um, People are talking about this now is that um, some people were extroverts and they don't have that anymore. Some people are introverts. They're in their, they're in their comfort zone um, now sometimes with COVID, but still the mind is something that really plays tricks on you and you got to find something that's your outlet. And I know, um, COVID, uh, has, has hurt some people. Um, but it's also brought a lot of people together in my house. It's really brought us together and we've been able to life for life to slow down and enjoy those moments. Um, but I would say to people and I would challenge people, you know, if you have that friend or that family member in your household, um, or that roommate that, you know, is, is struggling with something and they just need an outlet, I would honestly, I would recommend a board game at any time, you know, just to have fun, to sit, to sit down and just be out like, cause it gets your mind off of things, lets you focus on something. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, a lot of people are like, Oh, let's watch a movie. Let's watch TV. Let's watch this. And sometimes I, for me, that's like, that's like just mind deadening. I do enjoy a great 
TV show and, and binge watching shows and all that stuff. But um, I want my mind to work. I want my mind to think about stuff because I can watch something and really enjoy it. But then my mind is still triggering on something else. My mind's not actively working on something that mm. allows me to escape the other thing Definitely. and for me that's what that's what board games has always been mm -hmm. oh so. yeah 100 yeah my um whenever my uh my wife is like nervous about something or, or like, something's really focused on her mind I, those are the times i really try to push playing a board game with her because for that for that hour that's all she's thinking about you know yeah i i try to like really get her engaged and those are the, those are those are i think especially the best times to to pull out like a very complicated game because that's what you have to focus on, and um, uh, and honestly, like for for somebody that's not a, a gamer, somebody that never really considered themselves a gamer, I feel like she's liked everything that has hit the table so far. Um, and I th I think that's important because you know you know what she's into, and I think that's great. You know, yeah. I think it's good for hobby for people who are hobbyists to make sure you're adding to a collection, not something that you that you just like, but something that you know other people are going to like that you can enjoy as well you can tolerate it whatever the case may be but that you know that that they're going to be able to sit down with you you're not going to pick out twilight imperium fourth edition sure. you know for for someone who really only wants an attention span of 30 40 minutes mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. yeah you know and and i think that was one thing i challenged my brother to you know actually it was funny i had my brother um asked me hey let's let's get together for a game night he, he knew that i wanted that mental break mm -hmm. um you know with my wife being in school um it's it's tough for us to sit down and play a game so he's like hey why don't you just come over you live right down the street let's um let's play a board game yeah. so me uh, me him and my our youngest brother we got together we played scythe mm -hmm. um and it's very heavy for definitely my young my middle brother who's never played board games at all especially nothing past party games mm -hmm. um and he says i can only have an attention span of 30 minutes why'd you bring a two-hour game over um, <laughs> But he said at the end of it, he was pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. that he was locked in for the entire hour and 50 minutes that we played. And he would gladly play the game again in a heartbeat, which is awesome um, to do is when you have someone who's willing to want to try something new. But yeah, try something with your friends, try something with your family um, and get something to the table. Uh, enjoy that time with each other. So, but new one, it's been a pleasure to have you. Um, it's been, it's been an honor. I thank you so much. I appreciate our friendship. Um, anything you want to say before we, we close it out? Uh, no, just if you, if you get a chance uh, and you've looked at a card game before uh, you think you can get a couple of friends to play it. I think you should go for it. It's, um, it's definitely rewarding. It's fun. It's, it's something to do. That's not harmful to anyone. Uh, and it's, it's worth, it's worth adding a new hobby to me. Um, you may find yourself liking it more than you should. So keep an eye on those wallets too. But, uh, <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah, just have fun. That's what this is about. Awesome. Awesome. So whether it's playing a board game, playing a card game, um, Definitely, like I said, check your wallet because it does get expensive on both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> but, um, just enjoy it with the people that you love. That's the most important thing. So again, I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank you for joining today's episode. Again, the challenge is for you guys to go out there, share the hobbies that you enjoy with someone else in hopes that they discover something new that's worth checking out. So maybe that someone is us, all right? Maybe you want to share something with us. If so, why don't you drop us a line? We're on Facebook instagram and twitter at lobby of hobbies we're also you can get us on our email the lobby of hobbies at gmail.com um, we're going to be moving some things over to a new youtube page that we're going to be starting we've had it um we ha do have it up there's some small things on there but we're going to start doing some board game reviews some more playthroughs things like that as covid starts to open up mm -hmm. but check us out um we're definitely a small channel out there but the idea is for us to have an outlet for those people um that just want to talk about things but we appreciate you guys being with us uh signing off this is jazz we'll check you on the next episode later guys <laughs>